also the horseshoe kelp out here, uh, grateful barracuda. But there's two ways you can fish this area. What I do is I hate throwing the anchor for one. So you can either, once you position yourself over the half spot, you can throw the anchor, and I hate putting an anchor in 80 feet of water, so I throw a marker buoy over. You throw the marker buoy over, there's a little weight that sinks to the bottom. So now you've got your position, and at the same time, you can figure out which way the current's going by the way that marker buoy is going to swing. If it's going this way, you cast uphill from it, or up, up current, let that line sink down, and um, you, know, you may get lucky. A lot of these fish on these Half spots, all these little reefs and wrecks, they're not all the way down to the bottom. They kind of suspended off the reef, maybe, you know, two, three feet. If you find one of these spots that has a high relief to it, which means anything coming off the ocean floor, those are your key spots to fish. Um, eight to ten weight rods, you know, obviously because you're fishing a heavier line to get down deep. Ten to fifteen pound tippet, you're fishing a little open water. Um, I prefer using conehead flies. Conehead flies sink vertically, whereas the clouds has kind of got a planing action to it when it goes down. On this day here, myself and this guy Brian, we're fishing the break wall overcast. We're getting a lot of uh, calico bass. We turn around, saw the birds diving off that horseshoe kelp area. We ran out there, immediately a bunch of barracuda. Um, we switched up flies, obviously, to like an anchovy pattern, black and white. And Brian let it sink down. Um, we started getting a bunch of these nice cuda. Uh, cuda's kind of a fickle fish. You only come into the area when the, when the water's prime, nice and blue. Uh, they don't like that, that dirty green water or, or off-colored water. And they all go where the bait fish are. Uh, this year, for example, I don't know if you guys heard the news, but these cooters started up off in Santa Monica Bay. The conditions were a lot better up there. As spring progressed closer to summer, the water conditions off Long Beach got a little better. The fish moved down and they moved out of Santa Monica Bay. So the cooter move around a lot. And some, days, some years they're in there for a month. Sometimes only in there for three days. So, you know, read the newspaper and see what the counts are for your local uh, charter boats. And it's one way of depicting where these if there's any cooter out there. Uh, this is off Huntington Beach area. <coughs> Again, there's a bunch of reefs and wrecks. This is the notorious Huntington Flats out here. I'm sure most of you guys have heard about that. Uh, what's so unique about this area is in the summer months, all your sand bass move off the structure. And they come on those mud flats to spawn. Uh, the last few years haven't been that great for the fact that we had a bunch of Humboldt squid moving off Newport and they kind of invaded this whole Huntington Flats area during the time of that spawn and they devoured everything. But you still get them there, your barracuda visit that same area. It's pretty much a summertime fishery on those flats, otherwise it's, it's desolate, there's nothing there. But if you go out today, for example, all these reefs, wrecks, artificial, they all have fish. There's one area in particular that I enjoy fishing is this Newport Reef. And these are real squid, and there's some of my squid patterns right there. I use a vinyl glove to tie the, the mantle. Yeah, this is called the mantle of the squid. They're all two flies, so you can feed in whatever size hook you want. Uh, Catalina Island, probably the best Southern California destination. There's two sides to it. This side right here is the side that faces the mainland, the lee side. And then you've got the back side right here. Um, what's so unique about the front side here, if you look at the color there, that dark blue, that depicts deep water. And that deep water right there is really close to the island. And what that does is it pushes your bait fish, your sardines, your anchovies, your jack smelt, your top smelt, your juvenile uh, flying fish, really close to the island. And behind that, you've got your bonita, your yellowtail, of course, calico bass, feeding on those fish. So, you know, as a fly fisher, 
for one, it's always sheltered behind you. You, get, you do get your rough days, but for the most part it is. Um, yeah, you can tie up those patterns and chase those bonitas. Uh, it does it does fish best in the summertime, July, August, September, you know, two good months. Um, in the springtime, if you're chasing white sea bass, this area right here, fish is really good. There's a long stretch of beach. If you want to fish shallow, especially for a fly rod, uh, you know, you're fishing tight to the beach, uh, 15 to five feet of water, cast up onto the beach, you can retrieve your squid patterns, olive and white clouses, and you do, sometimes you get pretty good luck. Uh, the further you go up the island, it becomes really rocky. This is good for calica bass, all three here. And when you get up this area right here, you get back into that deeper water, which is good for your bonita. But pretty much your front side is going to be the go-to place. All my clients that I take out, you know, obviously, uh, you know, we can't target the three beads, Barracuda, Bonita, Bass. And I'm going to be fishing this area right here. Um, so it's kind of like a nursery to the smaller bait fish. Once that warm water establishes itself on the lee side of the island, that pocket of warm water pretty much stays there year round. Uh, once we get into like December month, January, we've got those cold fronts coming down. It does roll the water over and those bonita disappear. Your barracudas kind of migrate south too. As far as gear goes, 80 10 weight rods. I always carry a 12 weight in my boat. 300 to 500 grain shooting heads, 15 to 20 pound tippet. Again, with the tippet, straight fluorocarbon or mono, uh, nine foot length. The less knots, the better. For the fact that a lot of the yellowtail you do hook, if they are, if they do have any size to them, um, they're going to go straight into the structure, into the kelp. Floating lines, you can fish intermediate lines if the bonita on the surface. This gel spun backing, very important if you're fishing offshore conditions. Um, very abrasive. If you look at this gel spun on my left hand and stand it back into my right hand. You can see the capacity you're gonna get on your reel is gonna be more on the gel spin. The weave is a lot closer, so and it's a little little abrasive, so if you... Is gel spun the same as Spectra? Yes. Uh, the weave is a lot closer, a little more abrasive, so if you do hook a big yellow tail, let the thing run, and you know the abrasiveness on that line will do its sawing action through the kelp. If you guys fish conventional, over the last maybe six years, everyone's gone to the Spectra with a top shot you know, of uh, fluorocarbon, and they fish the white sea bass the same way. And that's the reason, is because that Spectra or gel spun will act like a saw and cut through the kelp. So the fish lost nowadays, conventionally, fishing this, uh, probably far few than years ago. The other reason why the, this, spec, this gel spun is so good, standard backing, the weave is a lot wider, so it absorbs a lot more salt water if you're not going to use your reel that often. And what happens is, on every reel, whether it's a $20 reel or a $600 reel, there's a little screw over there that holds on the handle. Well, that's going to be stainless steel. So when you get salt water in your backing, stainless steel, aluminum, you get the electrolysis. And this is a T-ball reel, $800 reel, and I mean, you can see this person left their backing on for quite a while, didn't really wash it out. He never had gel spun on. He had standard backing. Some of the flies are useful for Carolina Island. Uh, your island candy is going to be a squid. And then working down, this, this year will mimic um, your flying fish, which are kind of a blue hue to them, your mackerel, your jack smelt and top smelt are going to be your olive and chartreuse color. The sardine patterns, um, this is a cone head here, it's a big J bend back hook. That particular fly I like using for big calico bass, deep in the kelp. Uh, again with the cone head, if you throw that fly in the kelp, it's going to sink straight through the kelp. Your dumbbell eyes tend to get hung up on the kelp. This is the new skull head that's been out for about two years now. 
uh, nice and heavy, get down deep. That's a sardine pattern. These patterns here are tied up with yak hair. Um, it's not really a fruity material to look at, but it's a natural. And when it's in the water, it gets that elusiveness to it, um, pretty transparent. These chartreuse flies right here. This year was the go-to fly for all my yellowtail. Uh, you know, every year it changes, but this year, this little guy right here, I've caught all the yellowtail. This is an anchovy right here, Pacific anchovy. Some of the flies that depict that. Um, beginning of the season when the bonita show up. Little clouser style pattern with a red eye. Uh, it normally works better. Later on in the season, once those mackerel that have established themselves around the island, they get bigger. You don't want to use a fly with a red eye because every cast is going to be a, a mackerel. So this time of the year, I changed to a little bigger fly, a little bigger hook. And that's more of a combo anchovy style sardine. And the fly has uh, olive on the top of it. This is your typical Catalina firecracker yellowtail. Um, perfect for the fly rod. You can get this fish, uh, well, I wouldn't say on a six weight, but eight weight is, is a good size for this fish. Um, otherwise, anything bigger, sometimes they take you down into the kelp. And uh, that's where that spectra comes in handy. Right, offshore banks. Um, this is Catalina Island. This is where we are, Long Beach, Breakwater, Newport. All these banks are about, kind of average, the furthest one being 45 miles out, straight out of San Diego. Um, when I fish these banks, they typically launch from Newport, Dana Point, come out and see them. Uh, what's so unique about these islands, they little mountains underneath the ocean, and the current that comes down either side of Catalina or San Clemente Island, it hits these banks and it makes upwelling. And that up, upwelling in the summertime, it attracts um, your tuna, your marlin, your yellowtail, albacore, etc. <coughs> There's nutrients in the water. Your bait fish, like your common mackerel, Pacific mackerel, are going to be common out there, and your sardines, anchovies. At the same time, you get kelp that breaks off these islands. It congregates around these half points, um, which we target running around kelp padding hu hunting. And on those kelp paddies, you're going to get your Dorado tunas. 10 to 15 weight rods, uh, 300 to 700 grain shooting heads. That's a little heavy. Uh, only reason because sometimes your tuna don't come up to the top. They're down deep. So you got to get down really deep to them. Uh, typically your bluefin that they come up in our U.S. waters. The last two years, the pelagics and the U.S. waters have been terrible. There hasn't been anything. Most of your fish have been South Mexican waters, uh, at least a day and a half below, 70 miles. 20 pound tippet uh, plus, if you want to stay within IGFA records, obviously don't go heavier than 20 pound. You don't really have to worry about any, any structure out there, but maybe the kelp patties. A lot of times when you hook a yellowtail, He's going to come out, grab your fly, go back through the kelp paddy. Just let him run. Uh, there's nowhere else he can go. Uh, 